you uh, ask you for prayers um, you off this evening uh, for uh, I think someone was a fatality over here at Stern as we were coming down. There was a, actually, I think the person was killed, so we pray for him and we pray for his family. I actually also pray for a dear friend of mine who works, helps me out at St. Rose, uh, Brad Thomas. I've known him for about 16 years, both the Holy Family here. But he uh, had some kind of seizure and he collapsed this afternoon, so we have more at Seeding Island Hospital. So I actually pray for him. But I am absolutely delighted to be back with you for the second session, 20 top hits in history, 20 divine interventions, either surprises or chastisements, things that have shaped not just the landscape of church history, but all of history, and how important they are for us. You know, I talk about blessings and chastisements uh, as a person of faith. Secular historians generally look at history just as a sequence of events that just haphazardly happened. They don't see a grander plan behind it. So we have climate change, and then you have famines, and then you have wars, and, and then you have uh, diseases, and uh, it's just it's just the roll of the, of the dice of time and uh, the sequence of time. But as people of faith, we don't believe that. We believe a God is actively involved, created this world, not the deistic kind of thing, but that he's actually involved in the world, became not only in love with this world, but he became one with this world, incarnate in the world, and that we see history in the perspective and the prism of faith that all these events are in God's hands and does them. But sometimes God allows the choice of our life, even some of the sinful choice of our life, to play out in such things as punishment. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about God. Well, God, I don't believe in God that punishes. No, God doesn't punish. She just loves us so much. She allows us free will and things that we do have impact in our life and the lives of others. And we're going to see how that really unfolds in this next 10 dates from 1,000 forward up to the present time. So let's get going. The first date we're going to talk about is the Great Eastern System, 1054 A.D. Uh, this system erupted in 1054, but, but the events leading to it have been developing over centuries. And I alluded to that last week. Some of those problematic things were happening. Uh, what were some of the reasons? Well, the causes can be traced to a wide number of differences that have developed between the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire in matters of culture, matters of politics, jurisdiction, language, even elements of doctrine and, and theology. And these led over a period of time to greater and greater frictions. For example, uh, we slowly we see a gulf developing between the East and the West because of, last time I talked about the Arian heresy. Remember Arius lived in year three, well, he was Catholic condemned in year 325, the Council of Nicaea. He was preaching that Jesus really wasn't the divine Son of God. He was a super kind of human being, but not truly God. And uh, he was a very powerful, charismatic speaker. He was condemned at the United Council of Nicaea. Remember, he was condemned on the the strength of the authority of the church, not on the strength of scripture. It was because all of you said, we knew Polycarp was a disciple of John, and we're disciples of this guy, and his, we're the disciples, and they passed this on, you're wrong, we're right. And that's how it was decided, not on the strength of scripture, because he was very knowledgeable of scripture and very, very charismatic speaker. But the combination, because he had a lot of following in the East, uh, it, it started leading to some frictions. Uh, the attempts by the patriarchs of Constantinople to increase their authority over both the East and the West, the Sea of, Constant uh, the sea of Rome. Uh, another thing that came up was the Acacian Schism in the 5th century there. It lasted from 42 to 519. Acacian was the patriarch of Constantinople, and he, together with the emperor of the East, his name was Zeno, had written this document called the Henoticon. And in it, what they were trying to do, the politics were, they were trying to keep the empire together. These heresies were dividing the empire. That's why Constantine called the Council of Nicaea. Arianism was dividing the, the empire. Kings want the empire to be together. And Zeno wanted the same thing. So he wrote this document to try to appease the Monophysites. The Monophysites were the people that believed that Jesus Christ had one person, one nature. His human nature got absorbed into his divine nature. So he really wasn't two nature, just one person to one nature. Well, that was a heresy. It was condemned to the Council of Chalcedon. But the emperor trying to bring these people together, the Eastern Church with the Monophysites, wrote this document that was kind of appealing to them, but 
it didn't have, uh, didn't mention anything about the two natures of Christ, which to the Pope at that time, Pope Felix III, he felt that was a slap in the face of the people that met at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 that decided this, that, uh, that they were denying it. So he sent a letter to Acacius asking him to explain himself. Acacius ignored it, as the Byzantine side did, and they ticked off the popes. The pope deposed him, Acacius, he excommunicated him, and a schism developed in the church for uh, about uh, to 519. That's because a new, uh, a new emperor came in, and, or actually the new pope came in, Prometheus, and he reconciled it. But that was just another one of the tensions. Another uh, controversy came up is the controversy of three chapters in the 6th century involving Pope Virginius and the Emperor Justinian. Justinian, again, an emperor, was trying to reconcile monophysites with the religion of uh, the Orthodox to bring it together to keep his kingdom together. So he condemned three writings by Theodore of Mosleptia, uh, Theodore of Cyprus, and Elas. These guys were leaning into Nestorianism. Nestorian was the heresy of Jesus Christ had two persons, two natures. Huh? Two persons, two natures. We believe in our theology of Jesus Christ is one person, one divine person, with two natures. Totally distinct, but united perfectly. So anyway, uh, they, they were leaning in, and so Justinian calls Virgilius into, uh, over to the East, shows them a Latin translation of the Greek writings, pressures him to sign and read it as he pressured the eastern bishops. Uh, at first, Virgilius says, yes, the, the bishops of the west are ticked off. They wore an upraised about this. Uh, Virgilius said, no, we're not going to do it. And um, he's in prison under house arrest, so ultimately resulted in the uh, Council of um, Constantinople, two of them, to resolve that. But it took some time. The third thing was the decline of the uh, the claims of Charlemagne, excuse me, the filioque clause, that's a big one. In fact, that became the breaking point. Not at that time, but much later. What happened was in the West, under the Frankish kingdom, they started praying the creed with the filioque clause. That's a Latin translation for and from the Son. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, as we say in our creed. The East took great exception to that for two reasons. One, was it orthodox? They felt when you said to the Holy Spirit, they say the Holy Spirit proceeds just from the Father. You notice the orthodox, the Father, the Son proceeds from the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. They felt that the way the Catholics were saying in the West was that it was uh, subjugating the Holy Spirit to a lesser role, lesser place. Now, theologians have been arguing about this for centuries, and they say it's just two different ways of looking at it. But, that was a concern for two reasons. One, was it orthodox? Was it uh, orthodox doctrine? The second, was it licit for the Pope to insert that? Pope Leo the Great inserted it into the creed, and that kind of bothered them. Now, when I talk to my lovely Eastern Orthodox priests, they bring this up. They say, "Come on, guys, that happened in the uh, in the sixth, I mean, the seventh, eighth century. You didn't break for another two hundred years, so it couldn't have been that bad of a thing, really." You know? But it does come out to play later on. More signals of the ever widening ball. The claim to Charlemagne, who died at age 14. Remember last time I taught you he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD by uh, the Pope in Rome? It ticked off the East. Remember, I remember I talked about, remember Constantine split, well, not Constantine, that Christian split the empire. And in the beginning, because the, uh, the, the Emperor of the West was really kind of very weak, who took over? The church took over. But Constantinople rose in its power, the Eastern Empire, because it had the weight of the emperor behind it and the church. The problem is you get what we call Caesar or Papism. The government starts running the church. That's what caused some of these problems. The government was too close to the church, trying to resolve a, a, a real problem of energy in their, uh, in their empire, but unfortunately, starts interfering too much with the church. Well, Rome started growing, and then when, when Charlemagne threw his weight behind Rome, Rome grows in power now. So now there's conflicting powers politically, even religiously, even though the Pope of Rome was known as the first patriarch and the head of the church. So the fact that he was made Holy Roman Empire really, really bothered him. Also then came the Phocian Schism in the year 863 to 867. Phocius was a layman. The real patriarch of Constantinople was a man named Ignatius. 
And the emperor, Michael III, decides to depose Ignatius, the validly elected patriarch, decides to depose him and put Photius in place. Photius wasn't even ordained. They had to quickly ordain him, consecrate him, make him kind of, well, that didn't set well at all with Ignatius. He refused to give up his uh, receipt, which he had the right to as uh, you know, duly elected ordained patriarch. Also didn't set well with the Pope at all. Pope Nicholas I sent legates to protest. Um, and when they got there, the, the emperor kind of really threatened their lives, so they agreed with what had happened. The time Nicholas got word of that, remember now, some of the biggest problems happen is why? Communication is so hard to get messages back and forth. It takes four or five months, so someone slaps someone over here, by the time he gets back, it's three months, and then they double slap them. And so it's going back and forth, and it makes it very hard because you don't have instant communication. They didn't have texting in those days. You know? By the way, I see what Sunday has. <laughs> texting. They didn't have that. So that's part of the problem that you're dealing with in terms of culture, communication. So the end result was that um, uh, Nicholas excommunicated Photius, Pope excommunicated him. Uh, eventually they were in schism, and then a new uh, emperor comes in, he deposes Photius, puts Ignatius back in, then Ignatius dies, and then Photius comes back in. And eventually he was reconciled. But that was a, a schism again uh, done. The ultimate one, though, comes uh, in the fact that, uh, it, as you see, the decline of the Byzantine Empire is a major power in the, Europe, the Middle East, the rise of the Franks. It came a lot of mistrust and suspicion, but the biggest one came finally as we arrive into the uh, 11th century, in the 10 hundred, the thousands. The, the patriarch of Constantinople is now Michael Cellularis. He was a strong opponent of the West. The Latins, and he ordered all the churches in the territory in Italy, which was now part of the Eastern Empire, it's been a strange, but part of the Eastern Empire. He ordered them to adopt the Greek, uh, the Greek language and the Greek liturgy. Uh, Pope Leo IX, he tries to resolve the situation through negotiation. He sends a papal legate, Umbert of Silva Candida. The problem was, as, as Purely against the Latins, Michael was, the Patriarch Michael. This, this uh, Humber of Silva de Canida was even worse. And he went to Constantinople, he was already spitting mad, and the time he gets there, he's really mad. So what does he do? He goes and lays in Hagia Sophia, the great basilica of the East, goes and presents an excommunication, lays a right on the altar. That did not sit well. Uh, Michael Sergaris uh, excommunicates the Pope, and here comes vision now. Michael Sergaris goes back to the old irritations of through the Oakway Clause and the erosion of the uh, Latins into his territory, he says, and so they use those as the reason. But these are things that have been developing through cultural, political, economic differences over a period of time. Unfortunately, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, <coughs> efforts have been trying to reconcile this, but uh, one of the problems was that uh, the efforts were uh, hindered by the 12th, uh, the 12th before, by the 4th Crusade. What happened there was they came through and they were supposed to go attack the Muslims down in Jerusalem and they go and sack Constantinople. Big, big wound in the life of the East. And, uh, some success was achieved later on at the Council of Lions in 1274, and then at the Council of Florence from 1438 to 1439. But uh, there was a great unwillingness to suspicion and hurt on the East to even be attempted. It all came to an end in 1453, when the Ottoman Turks captured the, uh, the city of Constantinople. It was such a devastating thing. We'll hear about it a little bit later on when we talk about Islam and Christianity. But it literally caused the King of England to be the fourth to have a, a heart attack and die when he heard that this had fallen, and that was that severe. Uh, in the recent times, relations have improved in the Orthodox Church and the Roman Church uh, through the attempt of both John the, the 23rd and Pope Paul VI. Remember, and uh, uh, Athenagoras I met with Paul VI. That was a huge historic meeting. Uh, later on, with Demetrius I. And then uh, John Paul II and Benedict have reached out. We're working, we're getting closer, but it's tough. It's tough because still there are there are political.
theological issues going on there. It's not just theological. The theological issues have been discussed by theologians. They're not that far away. It's mostly about who's going to be in control. So we're not there yet, but we keep praying. And the significance of this is the following. Uh, it's the first major split in the Catholic Church. We can mean the power of the church because there was the break in the great unity of the church. We're no longer breathing the breath and the power of the Holy Spirit, with, as John Paul II said, right. with both lungs. Also, a lot of things that happened in the East, the East had more heresies, but part of it is because of, of Caesar or Papism, when, the, pole, when the, the government tries to interfere with the church. This is going to come back. We're going to talk about that because it gets closer to it even our own time now. Let's move to the second date. That's the Protestant Reformation. Sometimes I say the divine intervention surprises a chastisement. This is certainly true in the Protestant Reformation. In fact, historian Paul Johnson called it one of the greatest tragedies of human history and the central tragedy of all Christianity. And I agree with that. What was happening in the lead-up? You gotta remember that we came out of the Cluny Re Reformation. Remember that I talked about that last week? How the monastery of Cluny reached new, not only monastic life, but lifted up the church and Europe to a glorious, glorious time. And so people talk about the Middle Ages being a, a dark age. And I said, there were some glorious things going on. The problem was uh, things started happening because people slowly started moving away from God. When things started going well, you all know in our life we have a tendency to kind of forget God. We kind of put ourselves front and center. And things started happening. Uh, what set up the Re Reformation? Well, a couple centuries before Luther, Luther would post his thesis on the Church of Wittenberg, there was a number of calamities that, again, I see is in the context of faith. Calamities speak about God allowing things to happen to chastise us, get us back on board. For example, there was this famine of uh, 11th, uh, in 1315, 1322, the living was so bad in Northern Europe, it killed 10% of the people. Followed up uh, by seven major famines in, in France. Even worse came the great thing we know as the Black Plague. Remember that, that horrific death that killed uh, untold millions of people in the most horrific kind of way. Also, we had the Hundred Year War in the 13th and 14th century between France and England. The papacy itself was experiencing incredible setbacks because of the Avignon papacy. It was a time when a French pope was elected through the interference of the French government, and the guy was French, who stayed over there at Avignon, and there were seven popes, 67 years, and the papacy was in France, not in Rome. Eventually, Catherine of Siena grabbed the pope by the ear and dragged him back to the time. Uh, God bless those women, they got him back to the pope right now. Uh, all this was happening, uh, it was causing problems. There was also the great Western schism. In the year 1378 to 1417, there were three claimants to the uh, papacy. One was legitimate, two weren't. But the Council of, Counts, uh, of the Constance that solved the problem kind of basically wiped out all three, and then they liked the new um, But it started promoting a heresy called conciliarism that said a general economic, uh, ecumenical council had more power than the Pope. That'll come to play later on in time. But that was going on. Finally, what else was happening was that, we'll get to this a little later on, the Muslim encroachment happening in the 12th, 13th, 14th century and what that meant. Well, the, all those kinds of calamities were just a preview for something even more significant, a greater chastisement, and that was the Protestant Reformation. When you study secular historians, they'll, they'll give you this kind of version of the uh, Protestant Reformation. Clergy were immoral, the monasteries were sinkholes of iniquity uh, going on with the sale of indulgences, simony, the sale of clerical offices, you know, like popes and abbots and monasteries. Uh, there was a great dissatisfaction with the Catholic Church and a greater yearning for simpler uh, religion, more faithful to the gospel, one that puts simple people in touch with God. Uh, the invention of the movable type, so they had the Gutenberg Bible made at that time, and it was the first time that these these are secular historians. It's the first time that the Bible was put in the vernacular so that people, the common person could read it, it didn't depend upon the priest telling them what they believe. Uh, by the way, these are a lot of them are lies, not true, because the church had already translated the Bible in the vernacular about a century and a half before that. Uh, things like uh, social economic changes in Europe after the Black uh, Death had led to growing restlessness among the population. Uh, they wanted freedom. But the huge, rich monasteries vigorously resisted the change. 
After the Black Death, parish priests were in short supply, so the priests were demanding more money. I hear that. No. <laughs> the short priests, I want more money. Uh, the church often refused leaving the people without a priest. This led them to seeing priests as unnecessary. Ordinary people often had to pay for the basic church services. Many could not, so they began to see the elaborate services as unnecessary. These were not true. These are things that secular historians say, but it's not true. So finally, a German priest, an Augustinian monk, uh, Martin Luther, stands up and he objects to it all. He's outraged by the selling of indulgence, stood up and protested publicly, and that was the beginning of the great renewal of Christianity. That's the secular version. Now, some of those issues were present, no question. But they were not the reason why the Protestant Reformation happened. And why do I say that? Because we had much, much worse times in the church before that in terms of immorality. We had guys like Alexander VI who had how many illegitimate children? I mean, we had, we had a lot of things that were worse off at worse times. And so it just wasn't the fact that there was immorality in the church. And many in the church knew that there was need for institutional reform. They were badly needed. For example, the extravagant lifestyle of certain priests and dissolute priests. Uh, the church had been preaching that. Bernard Clairvaux in the 1100s, 1150, was preaching on this vigorously, sermon after sermon about the change that was needed. Also, the church was working uh, actively to address a lot of the abuses, such as sinity and the wrongful selling of indulgence, and I'll get into that. The Fifth Council of, uh, of Latin, in fact, had many of these things on their its agenda, and that was the council was held 1512 to 1517, even before the Reformation began. Uh, the selling of indulgences. See, an indulgence, what was it? If you were given a penance, Louis, let's say you did some bad things, and so you got to do, a, you got to do the Compostello pilgrimage to pay for your sins. Well, you were a busy, busy businessman. You couldn't do that. So you could make a offering of money to the poor in place of doing that penance. That was the, the indulgence was the prayerful. The prayer that would do reparation for the sin, and you could not say buy the grace, you're not buying grace, but in reparation uh, for your sins, in place of that, if I can't go on the pilgrimage, I would give this offering of money to help the poor. That's the difference with adults. It's not your buying grace, but in certain cases, people took it that way. They say that Johann Tetzel used to have a line with the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and, uh, I think that was, uh, I, I honestly think that was uh, kind of made up. That was kind of made up. The fact of the matter is, the Pope, Leo the Tenth, he wanted to, uh, he, he promoted the sale of indulgences uh, to help build this new St. Peter's, and it burned down. And there was another guy, an archbishop in Germany, I think he was trying to pay out gambling debts. You know, and, and so, but in many, many areas of the church, this kind of behavior was absolutely forbidden. It wasn't allowed in the diocese. What were the factors that really led to the Protestant Reformation? Number one, a spiritual coldness. Remember, what's the line that governs the church? Semper reformandi, always in need of reforming. There's no such thing as standing still spiritually as a, as a believer in Christ. You're either moving forward with effort and by cooperation with or you're sliding backwards. And it's the same, if you know in our life, it's the same for the church. The church went through this great renewal of the, the, the Cluniac reform, uh, led to the Gregorian reform. It's a wonderful thing happened, and all of a sudden things start sliding backwards because the going is good, you know. Just like here in America, the going is good, and all of a sudden we got a little soft, we got a little lazy, spiritual, we got a little flabby. And uh, that's what was happening. St. Francis, living in the 1200s, said a spiritual coldness had entered the world. And he was talking about uh, a spiritual icing, but he wasn't talking about charity because a lot of great, the church was doing a lot of great charitable works in their hospitals and everything else. He was talking about the fundamental commandment of love of God. He takes precedent over all things. That started moving to the side. God starts moving off center stage to the side. And other things start entering in. And that's what started happening. There was also heresies. Now, most of the heresies fizzled out, except the one with the Catharic heresy, uh, which denied the real presence. Actually, Catharists were uh, renovated, they, they renewed the old Manichaeism heresy. But uh, most of them didn't do much, but they are enough to kind of weaken the faith. So there's a spiritual coldness and this heresy, and then added to that situation was a growing unchecked capitalism. Through the Middle Ages, 
Merchants um, were part of what they call these guilds. They're wonderful. And these guilds operated on Christian principles of providing social services to their members. They regulated the quality of work, paying just wages, and charging just prices. But during this time, in the 15th century, in the 16th century, there came this growing capitalism, proto capitalism, and it became kind of unchecked capitalism. Not anybody governing it. And the principles of God, because God's not center stage now, not really over. You pull the center peg out, things start fumbling, crumbling. Well, this unchecked capitalism led into greed. Now, greed might not crowd out God totally, but I'll tell you what greed does. It eats things to waste spiritual fervor and the taste for time consuming contemplation and devotion and zeal for charity. There was also, as I mentioned, the troubles plaguing the Papacy, papacy is distracted because of the Avignon papacy, the great western schism, uh, even the fact that Pope Leo X was, was allowing the selling of indulgences, which was contrary to faith to build a St. Peter's Basilica. And finally, and this is the significant one, finally, uh, what comes into place is the new ideas of William Ogden. He held that the human mind is capable of knowing only individual things, not universal concepts. What's significant about that? It really just threw out the window all of the mystic philosophy, that we can know things, we can know the truths of faith. Uh, you can't prove the truth of faith. You can reason to it. But what does this do? It restricts nominalism to what I think truth should be, what I believe it should be. And this is going to have a significant impact. The loss of confidence and reason, ability to demonstrate the existence of God, the new idea of true truths, there's faith and there's reason, made for theological uncertainty and even futility. And this is what sets us up for an incredible, incredible disaster. See, nominalism was very popular with the Reformation circles. In fact, Luther said, Martin Luther said, reason is a devil's whore, it must be drowned with baptism. So, this individualism, focusing on what I see and I perceive what I want, this individualism starts infecting politics, economics, and religion. Also, uh, this, this new individualism was, that was being fueled by business was also promoted by the, the, the media at the time. Uh, they really promoted this, and that's where you get the guys like uh, Machiavelli, I think he did, or he's one that really did, but Machiavelli, the end justifies the means. All come down to this individualistic kind of outlook in life. So you start seeing now what's happening. These ideas represented the antithesis of medieval thought, which valued community over individualism, humility over pride, and Catholic morality in every sphere. This is slowly being pushed aside. So spiritual coldness, preoccupation with worldly affairs, leading to greed, individual as a result of being. Uh, exposed uh, individuals in, in terms of expression and of belief in terms of our theology, it creates heretical notions that also start corrupting thought. These factors led that to many people's minds confused and sold defenseless before the big tidal wave. So let us go on. And, and I'll say why this is important, is that you're going to only hear from the secular theologian, uh, the secular historians, the first list that I gave you, what caused the Reformation. Those things existed. But here's the question you ask. If those are the reasons for the Reformation, why didn't all of Europe go Protestant? If those were really the reasons, then all of Europe should go Protestant. But if you look at the map, uh, the Protestant area is, is, is pretty small. The, the kind of the greenish areas where the Catholic Church still was reigning. The other areas, such as you know, right here, that's Calvinism, Lutheranism up here. He gets up and it's, uh, this is King Henry, we'll talk about him, that was John uh, uh, Knox up there, and Calvinism, I mean Luther's an instrument up in this area. But all this stayed Catholic, because the Catholics weren't looking, I mean the church wasn't looking for an overall overthrow of everything. They were looking for renewal, reform, but they weren't looking for throwing everything out the window. They weren't looking for a whole new religion. There were things that were bothering them, so that was one of the, the, the problems, the fact that 
Reformation, where it did succeed, it succeeded because it was tied to the practice of subjecting religion, doctrine, dogma to public debate and people's individual decision about that. Sound familiar, folks? Yes. Cafeteria kinds of Catholicism, you see. Things repeat. That's why it's important to know some of this history. And in place of divinely revealed truth, authority will be taught by a divinely inspired church. People are asked to choose what they wanted to believe. Cafeteria style Catholicism, Gallup poll kinds of approach. You see that going all through our media. 98% of people in Catholic say this, which is a lie anyway. But in the areas that became Protestant, religion also became mixed with politics. Here in Germany, up here, what was happening? There was a nationalistic movement. People are trying to move away from the empire. The German princes want more authority. What do they use? They use religion as a wedge, just like in the East. Remember over here, I talked about Caesar and Papers, so this is another form of it. They wanted to use religion as a wedge to divide, divide the empire, to get away. They also wanted what? The monasteries. They had huge amounts of wealth because when people died, they donated the property and the wealth to the monasteries. And the monasteries, by the way, were the greatest source of charity and learning that we ever had. In fact, read that book called The How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization, mm -hmm. Western Civilization by Thomas Woods. Brilliant mm -hmm. book. You get off your stand in your chair and cheer for Catholicism because it's so wonderful. But they wanted that money, so they used religion to divide it, use it as lead to get the money and to start their own nation. Now, I don't have time to go through the whole uh, theology, that's not the intent of this course, but I can go through a few things about Martin Luther. You see, Martin Luther, uh, he was really into this individualism, fit right into his whole life. And I'll tell you why. He, Martin Luther had a huge struggle in his own life. If you study his life, he was incredibly scrupulous. He felt he couldn't be saved. The sinful was too bad. And I heard a wonderful former Baptist minister give a talk on this, who's now a Catholic, and he said, the greatest struggle in Luther's life was the fact that he had a very poor relationship with his own father. He can never please his own human father. His own human father never even came to his, uh, his first mass. He just he, he was at the ordination, he walked out, didn't go to the first mass. And Martin Luther lived with this heavy burden of never being able to please his father. Well, it, didn't, it wasn't far to translate that to his heavenly father, because he had a, a serious struggle spiritually with scruples. How am I ever going to please? I can't think of my earthly father. I can't please my heavenly father. And his only solution to all that was to come up with this whole principle of justification. Justification, you're justified simply by belief, confessing your faith in Christ, believing he rose from the dead. That's how you're justified. It's a legal term. Jesus covers you with his blood, once saved, always saved. And he based it all upon what things? His three principles of individual soul of faith, soul of gratia, soul of scripture. Faith alone, scripture alone, grace alone. That was his way of solving his problem of his own personal struggle with spirituality. Well, what begins to happen when we have that? Uh, by the way, Luther didn't say that good works shouldn't be done. He said they should be done, but they weren't essential to salvation. Once saved, always saved. But, you know, it's only human to conclude if something is not strictly necessary salvation. Guess what? Takes the back seat. And so this whole thing, and you'll hear it a lot, and these are wonderful, sincere brothers and sisters of faith. Our evangelical brothers and sisters, how do they ask the question, are you saved? Are you saved? Is Jesus your personal... Savior. 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 Listen, they're, they're wonderful people and part of salvation. But they don't ever make fun of that. But they, they, they've been taught this theology that's just between me and Jesus, and it's all about once saved, you can't lose it. That's, it's, that's, it. that's what they believe. Once you present the Jesus prayer, you confess your sin, you believe Jesus the Lord, you believe the rose from the dead, you have eternal salvation. But I've always pointed out when I read those little spiritual books, but why did I turn to the next page and say, now that you're saved, this is what you must do? Oh, well, that's because, you know, you have temporal effects and consequences of your sinfulness. Yeah, but I said, why are you telling me to either? If I got everything, I can't lose it. Because psychologically, we all know that you've got to continue moving forward or you're sliding backwards. But that's where it started going bad right here. Also, Scripture alone is the soul of faith. You pray to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead you all truth. You read the Scriptures. The idea that every human being can interpret Scripture for himself appealed to that strongly individual's mentality. And what happens every man becomes his own Hope. And you know what's resulted from that is that now we have 38,000 denominations yes. of Christians all professing that those two principles. Yeah. Good people, but you cannot have everybody be his own pope. That was not God's plan. 
So those are the, the, the problems that we have. John Calvin now, he was down in, in John Calvin was over in Switzerland area. And he went bought into most of Luther's theology, except for he promoted predestination. And we know what that is. That you are, from the moment you're born, you're predestined either to go to heaven or go to hell. But that's a pretty weighty kind of thing, you know. What side am I on? But why should I live? Why should I do anything about it? I'm already condemned to hell and nothing I can do. I can't, I can't do anything. You walk with grace. So what was the resolution? Because it was very, very uh, disturbing to people. The resolution was that uh, you could be part of the elect. You demonstrate by being a good Calvinist. But also, God rewards people. Remember in the Old Testament, if you were good, you were blessed. If you were bad, you got punishment. And he rewarded by monetary success, prosperity in your life. So behind that, uh, the fact was that you could mitigate uh, the idea that you could demonstrate, get ahead of the game by demonstrating that you were part of the elect by getting really successful in business. You know, God's blessing me. So it developed a really good strict code of morality, diligence, thrift, hard work, and sobriety, uh, all these other things, and foolishness don't involve those things because they take away from doing well in this world. And if you're doing well, then it's a sign that you are part of the elect. So what begins to happen? Business seen as godly activity, work that the result of the invention came over here to America, that's what the Puritanism, you know? But the problem is, is that uh, in a way, Calvinism brought medieval materialism and uh, religion and money making became one. And there's a danger because again, greed can set in and then the whole pattern starts all over again. Henry VIII, he didn't want to start a new theological system. All he wanted was to get married again. He wanted to divorce. <laughs> you know, it's true. He wanted to divorce Catholic Aragon, his brother's wife, and he married because of the whole connection that he was going to add to have an heir by the, the queen. Uh, she couldn't deliver a son to him, so he got in love with Anne Boleyn. He just wanted a divorce. Uh, the Pope wouldn't give him a divorce, so he created a system. He didn't create a whole new religion, but it wasn't long before all the people around him started to introduce change in the Catholic liturgy and doctrine. Uh, the end result was that in the reign of Henry's successors, the Church of England emerged, the Protestant sect of England, some Catholic trappings with various European or heretical ideas, and a strong association with the crown and patriotic duty and the hatred towards Rome. So, the summary of all this is, Agnes and worthiness first produced indifference to the things of God and love for our Lord grew cold. Then became the spread of philosophical errors through the philosophy of William of Ockham that would develop theological errors that were promoted by very charismatic and militant hesiarchs who preached this false doctrine and hatred for Rome. These new denominations formed that were very hostile to Rome. The unity of Rome was, uh, uh, the Christianity was perfectly smashed. Large areas of the church had won back through the great renewal of Cluniac and whatnot. That was lost. We did have a counter-reformation. We're going to cover that in one of the next dates. But it did retrieve everything. Uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that private judgment reached its logical con conclusion, ultimately over a 500-year period, in the self-worship of modern man. For every man his own hope, we determine what is right and wrong in terms of doctrine. will lead into the revolutionary period where every man becomes his own king, ruler, and it leads to every man's going to become his own god. And that's going to be significant. Also the fact that because, as I mentioned before, of this Protestantism and the theories behind it, the supporting pillars, so the things with the Grazias, so the scripture, you, we have over 38,000 now denominations claiming that, often teaching contradictory truths, nothing to argue. The bottom line is a great, great tragedy. In fact, Melanie Khan, one of the disciples of Martin Luther, said all the water in the elbow would not provide enough tears to weep over the disasters and the reform. The ill is without remedy. And Martin Luther, on his deathbed, would say, I must confess that my doctrines have produced many scandals. I cannot deny it, and I often, this often frightens me, especially when my conscience reminds me that I destroyed the situation in which the church found itself, all calm and tranquility under the papacy. He began to realize in his life what had happened. Uh, the tragedy is that the intellectual climate just didn't affect the church. They we're all part of a, a living organism, the body of Christ, that starts affecting everything in Europe. And uh, we lost certain things that we'll never recover. We lost almost 5 million Christian or Catholics in the Protestant Reformation. 
That'll move us to the next uh, date. And that is, I chose this one, our Lady Guadalupe, 1531. We'll spend a lot of time on this because I think most people are familiar with the beautiful story. Um, uh, Dr. Cortez remembered to this not the Aztecs of 1521. Christian missionaries who followed him tried to evangelize the Aztecs and they didn't get very far. Very few comments. Until, wonderfully, on December 9th, 1531, Juan Diego was in the church, a 55 year old winner, the convert of the faith, was going to Mass. And he walked by the famous hill of Tepeyac, on which was the uh, ancient ruins of a Aztec princess god named Tunazin. He heard music and singing. And always, the, the Aztecs, that always presaged some divine appearance. He was a treat, so he went to the top of the hill, and the beautiful lady appeared to him. Tanned, tanned complexion was peaceful like him. And she spoke to him in his own Nahuatl language. Juan Diego, your little son, I love you. I want you to know who I am. And she goes on, I won't do this whole thing. She goes on to reveal to him that she would like him to go to the bishop and build a basilica there on that little hill. So he makes his way to the basilica, sees Bishop Juan de Zumagara, and he, uh, he tells us, uh, the lady told me for you to build a, a, a basilica here on the hill. He said, thank you very much, very nice. We'll talk about this later. So he goes back to talk to the Blessed Mother. She appears a second time. There's four appearances over th uh, three days, from the 9th to the 12th. She says, the bishop said he wanted to talk about it again. Go back. He says, that's another you better send someone else. I'm not really the guy you ought to say. How many of us said that? Um, Lord, don't send me send him. And uh, God, no, really that person. No, no, you go back and you tell him. So he goes back. And he has to fight to the servants, and he says, Our lady told me to tell you they want some basilica built here. So he says, You tell her I want a sign. So you, that'll, you know, we'll, that'll get rid of it. So he goes back and tells the lady the third appearance. He wants a sign. She says, You come back tomorrow. Of course, that morning, he finds his uncle dying. So instead of going around the west side of the hill, he goes to the east side of the hill to get away. He's trying to get a priest to go visit his, his dying uncle. The blessed mother comes down the hill. Antiquito, uh, where are you going? You're supposed to go to the top of the hill. And he says, well, my uncle's dying. If your uncle is fine, you go to the top of the hill. The science there, he goes with a beautiful Castilian roses that are growing. So he cuts them, he brings them back, and she arranges them in his, uh, in his tomb. Uh, the tomb was made of, it's like a cloak made of pounded cacti, fiber pounded together. So very rough kind of surface. And she arranged the roses in the tilma, tied it up around his neck to tell him, you go to the bishop. So he makes his way to the bishop. And uh, he gets, fights his way, and then finally he says, I brought you the sign. He releases the tilma, the roses fall out, and he sees the bishop get up and fall on his knees. He, he thinks the bishop is really proud because roses don't grow in the dead of winter. She's really impressed with the sign. But on the tilma is the magnificent image of Our Lady of Montenegro. And uh, he just cannot believe it. And, Ultimately, on December 26th, they had a solemn procession up to the hill of Tepeyac, and they built a place there, a little church, it starts with a little church. Juan, uh, Juan Dieguito, he, uh, he lives in a little house right next to it, and he tells everybody <coughs> the story. And the reason the uh, extraordinary things happened is that uh, this thing has played such a powerful influence on all of Western civilization, especially for Hispanic brothers and sisters. It, it, our Lady of Guadalupe had been interceded miraculously a number of times in history. The great floods of 1629, 30,000 lives uh, were lost. Everyone would be condemned. Uh, we were being threatened. And they carried the image down to Mexico City from the place it was at. And it, the waters would be a, a big, horrible place, 1700s. And once our Virgin was declared patriots in Mexico on April 27th, the disease dissipated immediately. November 14th is significant. Have you ever been to the Basilica there? You can see that the, the, the aftermath of this incredible event, uh, the Freemasons had taken over Mexico. And, and again, you'll see in the area of revolution how things happened. And they took over and they, they tried to destroy it. They put a powerful bomb in the flowers in front of the image. And everything else was shattered except for the image standing there beautifully. And the cross that should have been blown backwards and away was blown forward, covered like almost like Jesus was covering his mother. Um. Remarkable thing, nothing happened to that. Nothing happened. It's just it's so, and more miraculous. You know, the people have studied this thing, experts, and they said that it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, expert painters said there's no way with a combination of oil and tempura and fresco painting, it's a, it's a variety that they've never seen before. The colors are unearthly. You can't paint on this thing with a definition. You need, if you get close to the picture, 
you can't, it, it loses its, its diction. When you step back, all of a sudden it comes in vivid things. Also, the colors are, are, are very significant. She's pictured as a mestizo, which is the combination of the Aztec and the Spanish. It's so very safe to people. She's also that the black thing indicates that the Jewish symbol of pregnant woman in the Jewish culture. The colors are very sacred to the Aztecs. The, the kind of the, the teal blues, the roses, very sacred colors, the Aztecs. And she stands over the sun, in front of the sun, and the moon, and there are the gods of the Aztecs. She stands more powerful than one, and she still points to her sun. On her, on her cloak, those are the constellations of the stars at the time that she appeared. Her on the cloak there. All these marvelous things, and remarkable in her eyes, they studied it, literally reflected as a human eye would. You will see Bishop Zumarag and the servants falling down to the knees, and it's in her eyes. Literally, artists say that it's absolutely unearthly. We believe that. And what's significant about this? That our Blessed Mother, our good Lord always sends our Blessed Mother now and at other times to remind the people, to the poor people that were conquered, that you are not alone. I, my son is with you and I'm here. This resulted literally in, they say 10, but uh, more scholars say about 25 million Aztecs uh, were conquered or converted as a result of that appearance. Zero before almost, and then 25 million. You got to know the fact is that, that Europe was losing five million Catholics. Now, two to four times are coming into the church, much like Brother Sisters in Africa today. Huh? Mm -hmm. We're losing, we're, we're, we're hemorrhaging. Why? Because the love here of Jesus and the, the God has grown very cold in American society. And when you have God out of the center, other things come in greed. Immorality, everything you see in history, that's why I say, you know, we point to history, it's just to repeat in our own lives. But God has not abandoned us. We're losing on one side, but God's bringing a zillion on the other side. This image, we're going to play a key role in the future we paint here, the key role in the Battle of Ponto. Our Lady of Guadalupe is the painters, the Americans are shaping landscape history in the Western civilization. Our latest popes, both John, John the 23rd, Paul VI, John Paul II, he went and visited his first pope to do that, he declared. She was the Madonna, the Our Lady of the Americas. But it's going to play a very significant role in the upcoming events of our, of our history. I know I'm running through this, but I, I think it's really important that we go through. Uh, we're going to come to the next date, that's the Council of Trent. As a result of the Protestant Reformation, finally the Council of Trent got together in 1545. It was four sessions, but it extended over a period of time. And the reason for it is because uh, all kinds of problems were going on. There was part was the papal reluctance because the Protestants wouldn't come to it unless the Pope was excluded and the Pope didn't want to be part of that deal. So it got delayed. There was also ongoing political rivalry between France and Germany. Also the Turks, the Ottoman Turks were coming in on the Mediterranean area. It was causing problems. And so it was delayed. Finally, the Council of Trent was convened on December 13, 1545. It lasted until December 4, 1563. Uh, it's the uh, 16th major council of the church. It had three periods with 25 sessions. It was held in Trent. We held it there to make it easy so that uh, the people that were in re reforming the Protestants could get to that. But it didn't really work out that way. That's why it was held there, and it was also held down here in Bologna. Uh, it went over in three periods, and what was happening in this? Uh, we won't go through all this because you don't have to memorize this. I'm going to give you a test later. <laughs> <laughs> the main objective of the council was twofold: to condemn the principles of doctrines and promises. Remember, every man his own pope doesn't work. And things got very confusing. What was really true? What was the teaching on original sin? What was the teaching on true justification? We believe we are justified by faith, but it's faith and good works. We're saved by faith and good works. Not that we can earn our salvation, but we cooperate in grace through our good works. You show me your faith without good works, I'll show you a dead faith for you. So uh, the church was articulating all that. It talked about uh, justification. It talked about the sacraments especially. And it, it started correcting a lot of the abuses in the church, such as the selling of indulgences and um, the synod, selling of, of, of religious offices. So all these things were being dealt with in this. They also defined in this council the fact that the church is the sole determiner of truth both from scripture and tradition, and define the canon of the Bible. Remember I talked about that last week? Mm -hmm. The canon of the Bible was first established in the Council of Hippo in the year 393. 
because there was some confusion back there. Remember, the church always will start defining things dogmatically when things are confused or being denied. That, and that's why you have to be careful. People say, well, the church defined this in 1545 or 1563, so they made it up in the 50s. No. It was perfectly understood until some guy named Arius in 325 started messing up. And, you know, when I, people tell me, I say, are you telling me that the church for 325 years did not believe that Jesus Christ was truly God? No, they truly believed that. And Arius said it wasn't true, and so they had to get together to articulate this the truth. And remember, we're dealing with supernatural truths. It's kind of hard to put human language and concepts to something that's divine and infinite. We can only describe it things in, in, in we define things, which means we create boundaries. That's why you have to be very careful, uh, like in our, our, our dialogue with the East and the West, you know, or Filioque, because there's a boundary. You can't go outside the de fine in your articulation of truth. But there's a lot of area to move around in there, huh? So you, you got to be careful how you how you how we, how we treat it. But but the church will set the boundary, saying if you go outside that boundary, you're out of line. That's how you get excommunicated. When these people say, you know, these politicians, I just simply say, look at, we're only, we're only clearly saying something formally, what you have said by your life. If you don't believe that, uh, if you believe abortion is okay, you're welcome to that opinion, but you're no longer part in communion with the truth. So you've excommunicated yourself from the church by your decision and your position, and what is a symbol of the union of the church is the Eucharist. So you don't receive communion if you've excommunicated yourself. We do that through mortal sin. That's why you go to confession before you go to communion, because why? If you got mortal sin, you're cut off from the, from the communion of the Lord and with the community. So get to the sacrament. So they just it, 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 it redefined the truth. And uh, it spent a lot of time looking at the sacraments, because those were especially denied. The hierarchical element of the church, the sacraments a lot were denied. And the fact that the Mass was the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And by the way, you're going to see this tendency of the swinging of this. We went for the Holy Sacrament. How many remember the Baltimore Catechism? Okay, so we've got a few of dinosaurs left. Uh, yeah, we defined the, the Mass of the Holy, the representation of the Holy Sacrifice of Calvary. And it, it, it's on sacrifice. Why was that? Because Martin Luther was denying that element. And we, we fell into that even in our theology. We talked about the communion table of the Lord. Yes, it's the communion table of the Lord, but it's also the Holy Sacrifice. You've got to keep those things together. And we went during Vatican II, we'll talk about that. So these things are being defined. It was to condemn the falsehoods and to articulate the truth. So the canon was established, the sacraments were clearly defined, the authority of the church was, uh, ordination was defined, it put an indelible character of the soul. That's why a priest is ordained forever, he's always a priest. The excellence of the celibate life, doctors of purgatory, the invocation of saints, the veneration of relatives were reaffirmed. Uh, as was the efficacy of the indulgences. Adulterers are real things, but there are such things as indulgences. Uh, dispensed by the church, but with some cautionary recommendation and a ban on yourself. The council was left to be implemented by the popes. So Pope Pius IV, he introduced the Trinity Creed in 1565. Pius V, who was the most one that mostly introduced it, he issued the Council of Catechism, the Council of Trent, that counts away for 500 years. He also would uh, introduce the Roman Gregory and the Roman Muslim. You hear about the Trinitine Mass, huh? Yeah. The Trinitine comes from Trent, the word Trent, that's where the word comes from. The Trinitine Mass was established. And when we had to renew of our church in Vatican II, it was very painful for people that grew up with this. They figured that Jesus celebrated the Trinitine Mass. No, the Trinitine Mass, that version came from that council. Very much the truth of what Jesus gave us. But everybody got so locked in, and it was ripped away so fast. It really caused a lot of confusion. We'll get to that. Uh, one of the great characters that really helped pull us together and carry through the end was Charles Borromeo, the great Archbishop of Milan, the great saint, who introduced the confessional box. You can thank him for that. He, when he was uh, he was so handy through his correspondence, literally brought with, uh, all these people together, kept the things going, and we can credit the Council of Trent a lot to his inspiration. Any questions yet? Okay, well, significant state, the Council of Trent spearheaded, <laughs> it spearheaded the Counter Reformation, led by St. Pope's, blessed with the aid of the Jesuits and the numerous respiratory saints. The Council reformed abuses in the institutional church, did great things and win back some of the people, but there was irreparable damage done. And that would play out. 
By defining Catholic doctrine as salvation sacraments, the biblical canon, other areas of council and cross disputes, doctrine between spiritual and stabilize the church for the next 300 years. Okay? That's how significant that date was. Let's move to the next date. If you want to stand up and stretch your welcome to because I know the streets are hard. This is a critical thing. The Battle of Lepanto. Remember, all these things are kind of happening at the same time, so you've got to see it. <laughs> this result of a series of divine surprises. I would like to go back a little bit. Someone asked last week about, are you talking about Islam and Christianity? Yes, I am. Who asked me that question? Okay, here we go. It's your turn now. This is what happened. The competition between Europe and Islam has been going on since the 7th century, since its inception, its foundation by Muhammad, the prophet. Islam came boiling up out of Arabia over here, conquered all the way this way, came this way across northern Africa, and then would leap into Europe over the Iberian Peninsula. That happened in the year 711, and it was led by the great Moorish leader, Tariq. And he crossed over and he claimed uh, that part of the land for the Islamic nation, for the Moorish nation, and even for himself. In fact, we still have the memory of him because the, the Arabic word for rock is evil. And his name is Tariq. Can you get the word Gibraltar for that? Oh. Gibraltar Tariq. He claimed it for himself. I know you like that little fact. Gibraltar <laughs> Tariq. He crossed over at this point and came in and entered. Over the next two centuries, he they conquered all of Spain. And then uh, they moved over the Pyrenees. <coughs> in that, and remember last week I talked about the great battle with Charles Martel? The Franks met him there in that area and they. They drove them back. Uh, a lot of historians poo poo and say oh, it was just a raiding party and it really wasn't that great. Yes, it was significant because it stopped the encroachment of the Moors. If it hadn't stopped, it had gone right on to Paris, taking that over and taking over France because that's what they did. Uh, what eventually began to happen is up here in the Pyrenees, there was a Spanish resistance led by the Spanish Visigoths in the Asturias Mountains. And eventually they started a movement called the Reconquista, and in 1492 completed under Isabel of Ferdinand. They retook Spain. Okay? That's what happened over there. But in the East, things weren't going as well as the East. What happened was that, the, 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 you know, remember the map, the, the Islam was spreading all over the, the, the Byzantine Empire, taking over all that property that belonged to the Eastern Empire of Christianity. And Pope uh, Urban II recognized the real problem and he made a rousing call for the Crusades. I'm going to teach a class next year, hopefully, called the Ten Lies about the Catholic Church. And one of them is about modern historians present the Crusades as kind of this doggone Western culture infringing upon these very kindly, uh, peace loving people and causing all this havoc. <laughs> no, brothers and sisters, the Crusades was a direct response. These, these Arabs and Seljuk Turks had come through, conquered, and not just conquered, you're hearing some of the horrific atrocities that were going on. Wiping out whole kinds of people, not totally. Because certain people, like Saladin, was a magnificent warrior for, this, uh, for the Celtic Church, or for the Ottomans, as was Saladin. I mean, uh, Saladin and Suleiman. They had great dignity. In fact, the Western leaders really honored them as being honorable warriors. But most of them were really vicious. And uh, they uh, eventually, the, the 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 first crusade was about the only successful crusade. They took over Jerusalem for about sixty. Uh, seven years, and then Saladin, the great thing, came back and beat the, the, the Battle of Hattin, and they recaptured Palestine and held it. Uh, excuse me, it was 88 years of Crusaders had. Okay, by the 13th century, the Muslim conquerors had reduced the Byzantine Empire just a fraction of what it was. Although Constantinople remained impregnable at that time, it hadn't been taken over. The Arabs were replaced by the Seljuk Turks, and then came the Ottoman Turks. Turkish people from the Asian steppes. They were converts to Islam, and they began to move in the areas formerly held by the Arabs and the Seljuk Turks. And they developed a very well-organized state system and a powerful military. And in the 1350s, they achieved a foothold in the Balkan areas uh, uh, in, in Europe. They're starting not to encroach into Europe. What made the Ottomans so fantastic? They had a great system called the Janissary system. It's probably not a good term, but it's descriptive. What they would do is when they conquered Christian lands, they would take and kidnap a lot of the young Christian boys. And they'd take them and they'd make them the Muslims, have a certain size. They would train them in military skills and also train them in education. And they basically rewarded them incredibly well. 
So they developed out of these kidnapped people this an incredible army of fanatical, super devoted warriors who were totally devoted to the Sultan because they were not allowed to marry, they weren't allowed to own property, at least for the first couple hundred years of this. They were not allowed to marry or own property. But they were richly rewarded for anything they did. So they had this tremendous loyalty to the Sultan. And because of this, it was this unbelievable force. A second thing that made them very successful is they had that 10 wonderful, incredible generals, one after the other, one better than the other, culminating in the great Suleiman the Magnificent. So they, uh, they come into power, and they start, uh, they start moving forward. And they eventually take the city of Constantinople. And the Sultan then, then, then said, said, hey, no secret is future plan. In an empire of the world must be one, one, one faith, and one kingdom. By the way, that's coming back to us, huh? Mm -hmm. It's coming yeah. back. With no major obstacle to the path of the Turks, what did they do? They swept north into the area ruled by Hungary. And they were going after Belgrade. Belgrade was situated right between two rivers with a huge fortified wall. What was significant about Belgrade? It was the entrance into Eastern Europe. If you get Belgrade, it could just fly right through Europe. So you're trying to take it. And it looked really bad. The, the Ottomans had this unbelievable army. Uh, they were so well disciplined. They were fanatics. They didn't care. They just fought for the Sultan. They had great weaponry. And lo and behold, here comes a divine surprise. In the person of John Hunyan. He was eventually made the commander in chief of the Hungarian army. Uh, for a while, you know, the Hungarian lords were all confused what to do. The king was double minded. Finally, in desperation, he produces, uh, he appoints him the commander in chief. And this guy is a warrior beyond all warriors. He just starts cleaning people's clocks. Takes one, this one battle after another, wipes them out. In fact, one time he appeared in the church just run, and they see him, they're just so terrified of this guy. He's called the White Knight. And he just had this incredible charisma about him. So eventually he, he wins back things and he goes to the defense of Belgrade. Two characters play this battle significantly. John Hunyadi and another great saint. Remember him here in California? San Juan Capistrano, absolutely. John Juan, John Capistrano had a vision of an arrow in the sky and said, by this sign, kind of like uh, Const uh, Constantine, by this sign you shall conquer. And so he rallied the forces, and he's in there, and now the Ottomans are gathering. Uh, a group of uh, Christian ships can fly and break the rock, and they get into Belgrade to kind of reinforce it, but it's really a small force. They're outnumbered literally four to five to one. John uh, Capistrano sneaks out and says, I'm coming back with the biggest army you're ever going to see. He goes preaches, preaches back just when he's in the army. <laughs> and John Hunyadi was about ready to go to, to make peace with the Ottomans. And it would not have been a peace, it would have been a severe thing. St. John Capistrano said, no, God gave me a vision. We're not giving up. We're not. And he started praying. And amazing, he said, all of a sudden, people started coming from all over Europe. They had been so impressed with the preaching of John Capistrano. Word got out, they started coming in from Germany and Poland, all over, and started coming in. They are still greatly outnumbered. And uh, as the battle started waging, John Capistrano would get out on a promontory point with a huge flag of the cross. He started waving it and calling on Jesus' name back and forth. And it just so fired up the people that they, they kept repelling these Ottoman Turks on the night of 21st of July. What happens is that uh, they, the Janissary Turks managed to get across the moat, climb over the wall, and it looks like that they're dead. Everybody's going to get wiped out. John Hunani throws everything in the kitchen sink out, literally. He poured oil and flaming bacon on top of these guys, and they turned the whole moat into a, a, a river of fire and separated the one force from the other. So they wiped out the guys inside, and they repelled the, the offense of the Ottoman Turks. The next day, a small group of Christians sneak out, and John Hunyadi said, maintain your defensive position. Don't move. Don't leave the city. Well, these guys, you always know, get a few. They go out. They start making fun of the Ottoman Turks. Then they start firing on them, and the Ottomans start running. So they start running after them. All the Christians decide the things start seeing them running. And uh, John comes from runs off from a uh, hill up there. He goes, he's going, no, turn back. You know, it's like the coach with the guy, Kobe Bryant's going to take a three-point shot at the end. <laughs> no! And when he goes, he goes, no, yes! <laughs> And that's what happened. John, John Capistrano said, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden he saw these Christians running pell-mell and it's frightened the Turks. They started running and they won the battle. Miraculous battle. They captured 300 guns and, uh, and they turned back the Turks and that turned back for a while. 
Another great soldier, those Franks comes in. Great, he was Scandrick. I don't know if you've heard of him. This is another great hero of the Christian faith. In 1423, his father was forced to give up George, he was George, and three of his brothers, they were became part of the Janissaries. Three of his brothers disappeared. We think they were poisoned, but we don't know for sure. But this man, George, becomes such a skilled, brilliant, courageous fighter that his all his troops call him Iskander Bay, which was the Arabic word for Alexander the Great. He was that kind of man, big, strong, fearless, tough, agile, you name it, he just had it all. And he was winning battle after battle after battle. We don't know the whole story. There's two versions, but basically we know that he eventually left, escaped from the Sultan's court, never where he came from, because he made a Muslim, he circumcised, and he's forced not to believe in Christianity. He goes back and he joins uh, the forces of John Vignani, he fights alongside him. And John Vignani, unfortunately, John Vignani and John Capistrano die a couple days after the big battle of Belgrade. They never got to enjoy the battle of uh, the victory very much. They died. This guy comes into power, Scandinavian. He is uh, appointed by the, the Pope to be the leader against it. And he is so powerful, so intimidating the other side. They won't even fight him. They made, let him become uh, literally almost king of all of Albania because he's such a great warrior. He drove him back. They knew that he, they were never going to beat him. He fought well into his 60s, died in favor in 1467. The Sultan finally told that last Europe, and here is your mind, loaded to Christendom. She's lost her sword and her shield. And they did, because immediately after his death, here comes the Turks again. The Ottomans start invading into, uh, into uh, Europe again. Under the leadership of this great man here, Suleiman. Suleiman reigned for 46 years as the head of the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. He was determined to conquer Europe, he had his grand great grand, grand, grand campaign in 1521 by taking now the battle of uh, the city of Belgrade. Now it's open to Eastern Europe. He's heading up into, uh, he also takes the, in 1522, the island of Rhodes. 1529, he turns his attention to Vienna. Because Vienna is the gateway to Western Europe. If you get to Vienna, he can go run, run for miles and miles, and no one would even uh, stop him. So he's eager to get it. But guess what? Divine intervention. Three, four weeks before the battle of Vienna, what happens? It starts raining, and it starts raining, and it starts raining. It rains for three and a half weeks straight. Vienna was surrounded by woods, so you couldn't come around it but only one side, and it had high walls. What made the Ottoman Turks so successful? They had huge brass bronze cannons, huge caliber things that just blow these walls down. They couldn't roll the cannons up. Because the world ground was so soft, they couldn't move the cannons up, so they couldn't use them to batter the walls down. So the Christians stayed behind, they held him back, the winters start coming, so he was forced to go back. Three years later, he tried it again. He got delayed by a very courageous group of uh, people in another Hungarian uh, fortress. It delayed him long enough, so the winter came again, he had to go back. And unfortunately, Suleiman never made it back, because he was dying uh, about uh, a little bit after that, 1566. Never entered Vienna. Christian repulsive. Remember I talked about divine interventions? Here's another one. Suleiman, well, I mean, the Ottoman Turks were successful because they had like 10 great generals in a row. His son was even as great as his father Suleiman. But his son never made power. How come? Because Suleiman fell deep in love with a beautiful girl called, uh, well, they call her in history, Roxalana. She was a daughter of a Ukrainian a priest, uh, and she was kidnapped as a young girl, being part of the harem of the Sultan, stunning and beautiful, incredibly beautiful, and he became his favorite concubine. Not just a concubine, he made her his wife. He made her his wife, and that broke the, actually the, the, the Islamic law. He couldn't do that, it wasn't permitted in those days, but he didn't care. He loved her so much. He had children from the previous concubines, and the, the great leader was his son Mustafa. The lion from the lion king of Mustafa. Mustafa was the great general. Oxalana had a son named, which had several sons. One was named Selim. Selim was a not, he was a shadow that his father Suleiman was. But Roxalana convinced Suleiman that beware of Mustafa. He had Mustafa strangled, and who comes into power but Selim? He was known as Selim the drunkard. He fell under the influence of the Grand Vizier, and so builds the scene for. 
the great battle of Lepont, because he starts now trying to take over, because the, the what do you call it, the uh, Islam controlled all the Mediterranean Sea. In Algeria, there was uh, Ulag Ali, he was the head of the Corsairs, the pirates, they controlled all this up here, and the other part of it was the Ottoman Turks. They eventually would come over here and try to take Malta, right over here, off of Italy. They got repulsed by the, the Christian Knights in 1565. So he turns his face and he starts coming down. He conquers the uh, island of Rhodes, Corfu, and he then takes on Cyprus. Well, the Pope is putting out all kinds of, of warnings that we've got to take care of this. We've got a big problem. So Pope Pius in 1570 he contacts all the chief rulers of the West to form something, to get something going. Everybody's so involved in their own life. Queen Elizabeth in England doesn't want anything to do with it. She's glad Rome has the problems. She's, uh, France has often been uh, allies to Turkey, so they're not going to help out. Well, Philip II, he doesn't go because he's too wrapped up in his empire of the New World. But what he does do is he sends his half brother, Don Juan of Austria, a young man, only in his 20s, and he sent dozens of ships. I think he almost uh, ultimately gave about 100 ships to the enterprise. So Don Juan uh, joins the other things that became called the Holy League. Vienna, Genoa, the Papal States, Spain, and the Knights of Malta, five groups. And they pulled together about 208 boats. That was 80 fewer than the Turkish fleet. They begin to go search out the, the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks are camped out over near Greece. But as the, the, the fleet of the Holy League moves forward, they come across all these monstrosities. Uh, what, what the Salim has allowed his soldiers to do, I mean, terrible things, massacring people. Uh, women knew they'd be sold into slavery as concubines and harems, so a lot of them would just throw themselves off the buildings not to be caught. A hunter got on board on one ship, and a girl, a girl named Amalda de Roca, she knew that they were, were going to be dead, so she ran to the powder room, and grabbed a, 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 a torch, and threw it in there, blew the whole ship up. They all died, but she wanted to save her, her friends and stuff from the war. The head of uh, the, the side of one of the chief cities on uh, the island side of the Spana Gusta, Bragadino was on the, uh, the was the mayor of the town. They flayed him alive, stuffed his skin, dragged him through the thing. I mean, just a horrible thing. And when the Christians came across this, it oh, they were angrier than you can imagine. Two of Bragadino's brothers were on the ship with Andrea Dory at Dory. What's happening now? A couple things. Got the 200 ships, they start sailing out. They left the sea them. They start sailing eastward, looking for the Turks. Some people want to take a defense position, not Don Juan. They want to seek them out. They're all mad now. Uh, interesting, on the flagship of Genoese Admiral, Giovanni Andrea Doria, is the image of our Lady Guadalupe. The Archbishop of Mexico heard about the threat of the Islamic threat in Europe, had an artist make an exact replica of our Lady Guadalupe, touched it to the original image, sent it to, uh, to the Pope, and gave it to Andrea Doria. It was on the flagship going forward. Significant. Pope Pius was seeking our Lord Lady's help. He gave her the image, he gave everybody a rosary. He was in Rome, he told all Roman Europe to pray the rosary. She was in St. Mary Major praying up a storm, seeking it. So on September 16, 1521, they leave with all the rosaries, start heading out. They, uh, they eventually meet the great battle of Hong The greatest battle is the Battle of Actium in 31 BC when uh, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony fought against Octavian and lost. The Turkish fleet was anchored in the Gulf of Corinth and the Allied ships approached. It not outnumbered them in terms of ships. They had about 80 more ships, but they were about even in terms of the number of people on the ships, about 30,000 apiece. Uh, the Christians had a, a, an advantage in this way. They had six galleasses, which were larger galley, sh galley, uh, galley ships, with side mounted cannons, first thing they mounted cannons on the side. Most of them were mounted in the front. So they had these side mounted, which were kind of like uh, the 16th century version of the battleship. And these were towed in front. Don Juan arranged his battle in this way. He had 63 galleys. He took the center. Vagarigo, obviously Vagarigo and his, his, uh, uh, the Nario were up here with 63 galley ships. These were the uh, galley asses. And the entry door was down here at 64. The night before, the wind was going this way. That's the way it would always went at that time of year. So it was blowing in favor of the, the Ottoman Turks. Everybody's praying up a story. Here comes the divine intervention. Miraculously, the wind shifts. Starts blowing this way. 
It moves into position. So when Ali Pasha, who's head of these groups, he was the commander in chief, he, divided, he was in a crescent moon in imitation of uh, Islam. He divided his into three forces. We saw what was happening here. Sarah goes up north. Ula Ali, a corsair, was down here. We took the middle. Wind shifts. Don Juan drives into the opposition. Uh, these guys move forward. They got rowers. Guess who's down rowing for them? All these Christian slaves. That's going to come into play in the end of the battle. Don Juan moves forward. These guys move forward. These two galleasses wipe out eight ships immediately. Don Juan charges in the middle. They come up. The way they were going to do it was he said, Don't fire at you. They can get the blood splatter. So they waited. And at the last moment, they moved forward. Ali Pasha's group tries to board the Spanish, but the Spanish are very skilled fighters with the sword. So they, through their swords, through the uh, crossbows, and through the arquebuses, which were portable flintlock guns, they drive them back. And then they try to board Ali Pasha's ship. Twice they get repelled. The third time they get on board, they fight ferociously. They grab Ali Pasha against Don Juan's wishes. They, they slice off his head, put it on the spike, lower the Ottoman flag, put up the Christian flag, roar after the uh, enemy. Go back if you can. Go back. Over here, Andrew Jordan moves forward. Ulak gets him in trouble. He captures the, uh, the Knights of uh, Malta's flagship. Don Juan kept Santa Cruz. He was from a Spanish marquee. He kept him in reserve until 35 ships here. When he saw um, Andrew Jordan in trouble, he comes down here. He drives into here, and they succeed in driving uh, winning back the flagship and driving Ulaq away, and they start fleeing, so they start chasing him. Up here, Sirocco flanks. He comes in here to the shallows, and he flanks Barbara Rigo. Barbara Rigo gets in trouble, and he is slain. And for a while, it looks like it's going to go bad. But by this time, these guys have gained the upper hand of the battle. They chase after us, and they turn up. They grab Sirocco. He gets knocked in the water. They pull him off. They cut off his head, put it on a pike against Don Juan's mission. He's a pretty nice guy. He didn't want to keep his head from the lost. <laughs> The end result was an extraordinary battle won. It happened on October 7th. Uh, only they lost 8,000 men. Uh, the other guys saw it lost 25,000 men. What was significant was the fact that down below, all these, every time they captured a the ship, who came up from the holds, the rowers, the Christians came up and fought against the Ottoman Turks. So that turned the battle in their favor. They lost these 117 vessels, 50 ships were sunk, 170 which were captured. It broke the hold of the Ottoman Turks in, on, on the Mediterranean and ultimately would break the hold of them all the way along. Uh, it was on October 2nd. The Pope was praying in St. Mary Major. He got up in the middle of the prayer and he said, basically, we won a victory. There was no way that he knew. There was no way he could communicate. He didn't have a text message in there. He just had this vision, and sure enough, that's what happened. He named it, it was called Our Lady the Victory for a while, and then changed Our Lady the Rosary. It's still celebrating on October 2nd. The significance of this battle is the following. Well, let me, Ottomans' hold was broken, but once more they started another one. They charged into Poland, I mean, up into Vienna. In 1683, they, they, they go after Vienna one more time. And it looked like they were going to conquer it at that time and take over Europe again. But lo and behold, God sends another surprise. John Sobieski, who was familiar with the Ottoman Turks, their language and culture, he, he knew how to dress like them. He snuck through the lines, right through their camp, got over to the Allies, told them what was happening. Came back. He also knew the way they fought. In those days, in 1683, they fought by doing sack work. They'd send people tunneling under the walls, put big explosives, and then blow up the walls, the walls come down. John said, Yes, we do that, so what did he do? He sent his sappers down, they had big battles under the ground. He kept it from bringing the walls down. And he held it at bay, and they eventually turned around and they won them in. And that broke the hold of the Ottoman Turks. They pushed back. By the time of the 19th century, they called the sick man of Europe, the lost. With World War II, their, their territory was divided. The English and the French took over, created their little territories. But the English, God bless them, they taught them how to be rebels. And ultimately, they taught them how to turn against the French, or the French against the English, and then eventually turn against both. And they started up the Islamic faith again. And then with the establishment of Israel in 1948, gave a reason to unite again. And so we're facing that. The fact of the matter, it was a huge battle, and it was so significant. Otherwise, like uh, when Attila the Hun was taking over uh, over Europe, uh, it could have been the, the loss of uh, the fact that we lost uh, all of uh, Europe to Islamic culture, and mm -hmm. uh, hence all the development came out of it. Let's move on. Oh, sorry. The Age of Revolution, 1789. Mm -hmm.
This is really significant because this is uh, so critical for our lives today because everything is playing out very much in here. And the French Revolution, what happened? What was going on? Once again, the spiritual coldness started entering into the world. You know, there's a myth that goes along with this that and you'll hear it from historians today, and you just pass through our secular universities and high schools. The myth of the revolution is this. The French lower class, especially the peasants, have been brutalized for centuries by self-serving Catholic clergy, indolent with ability. The king's been totally indifferent to the plight of the people, did nothing to reform the French society. Finally driven to desperation, the people rise up, overthrow their oppressors, set up an enlightened republic and form a government. And this enlightened republic and form a government did very fine things until some years later, Unaccountably, it fell under the control of radicals, and there was a brief period of, uh, of terror on the whole. The French Revolution was one of the good things of history. That's how secular historians in our universities teach. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be further from the truth. Oh, there's some truth, but not, uh, not a lot. Um, Santana said, if we don't learn from history, we're condemned to repeat it. And I'm going to bring this up because I feel that we're repeating the same patterns yes. today, and I want to highlight that. What was the background of this horrific event? Outside the church and within the church, again, there was a spiritual court of coldness. As a result of the Protestant Reformation, what fell in disrepair and uh, disregard? Devotions, especially. And if you remember, our blessed Lord appeared to Margaret Mary Alaco mm -hmm. in the convent of Arle de Monia and told him that there was sacrilege against the Sacred Heart and wanted people to do reform. And, uh, he asked her to institute, to have the king institute his great devotion to Sacred Heart to make reparation for the sacrilege against the Lord and against the sacrament of the Eucharist. The Jesuits were in charge of that devotion. They uh, did not carry it through, nor did the king carry it through. And that had a significant thing, because it's very interesting. The very day of that revelation, on June 17, 16, uh, what would have been? 1689, 100 years later, the French Revolution starts. 100 years later to the day. And I'll explain that. One of the things is that things had grown cold. Also, there was heresy going on. Jansenism, which was a Catholic version of Calvinism. Also, quietism. Also, there was a coldness towards God in terms of lack of charity. St. Peter and Paul, the previous century, established all this charitable work in these hospitals. And, it had grown cold. There was very, very few, about one tenth of what it had been under in the previous century, caring for the poor. So on the eve of the French Revolution, the, 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 France was still kind of a Catholic country, but uh, the spiritual life and social life was growing very much in disarray. Also, the French kings were not very good. They weren't paragons of virtue. They were flitting from one mistress to the next, and kind of doing it quite openly, uh, both Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, in the early part of Louis XIV, the Sun King's reign, he was very successful. He built France up to this glorious time. He built the Versailles and all these beautiful things. But in the latter part of his reign, he started having disasters. All his decisions were going south. His wars, he bankrupted the country, and uh, it was just terrible. His son, Louis XV, was even worse, more profitable. So they bankrupted the whole country. Also, what happens is, Louis XIV revoked the, revoked the Edict of Nantes, which was a agreement with Huguenots, French Calvinists, that they, um, they used to practice religion. Now, he was trying to pressure them to become Catholic and go to subjects. What happened was over 200,000 left, took the gold, all the technical skills, started working with the enemies of Rome. He sure converted them. He converted them to enemies of France that would work against him. Also, uh, the Protestant ideas of individuals have added fuel to the fire of the revolution. All this was going on. It just immediately leading up to it. Also, the Protestant ideas of individuals have led to the Enlightenment, a worship of science. You know, remember, remember nominalism is what I can figure out? Now, science is new, the new queen of all the studies. Mm -hmm. We can figure everything out. We don't need God. There's an explanation for everything. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the laws of nature discovered by science, this new social thinking, these philosophers are all fired up. They want to eliminate anything unscientific or irrational, so religion had to go particularly Catholicism, Voltaire was the greatest critic of that crush of those things at Voltaire. So customs, traditions, all the ideas were out, including the notion of original sin, which considered human nature always weak and prone to evil. Nonsense of the enlightened human nature is good, it's reasonable, but fully set free from the travels of custom and religion, it's going to do fabulous. This idea is carried on today that we can create our own heaven here on earth. 
We just allow ourselves to progress. We don't need God. We don't need religion. And you know, the guy that really promoted that was a guy named Rousseau. Uh, and Rousseau is called the godfather of the, uh, of the revolutionary thought. And Rousseau, you know, everybody really paints him as this great, enlightened guy. You know what the enlightenment people got their, all their ideas? In their heads. Nothing in reality. It was made up in their heads. Rousseau said, if I could just get rid of all these constraints of education, he wrote a seminal book called Emile. Let's talk about this young girl growing up and she didn't have lessons. If I give her the lessons, she grew up and learned by doing. And he's become the godfather of a lot of educationals today. They still hearken to his kind of stuff. He believed that uh, liberalism, uh, freedom, freedom from everything. Rousseau had one teaching job. And it was a hopeless disaster. In fact, he said that he got so angry that he thought he was going to hurt the kids, so he had to quit the job. And he had five kids by a mistress that he deposited into an orphanage uh, right after their birth, never took care of them. So here's a miserable father, a lousy teacher, who's telling everybody else how to run their lives. Sounds familiar, huh? <laughs> That's what begins to happen. So these ideas are floating around, and everybody's hailing these things. It's just so wonderful. And it begins to play out, especially if you eliminate all the stuff that's the breaks and direction in the Catholic faith. Also, these ideas were spread through the uh, Freemasonry, the secret lodge, the Freemasonry. That thing has been a devastating church, you know. Freemasonry is very, very uh, evil. To, also, some of the Catholic clergy bought into this kind of stuff, as they did through the 20th century and in modernism. We'll talk about that. They also, it's amazing, that for all the emphasis on science and the queen of science, so they got into all this stuff of the cold hymn, so that was very much part of the, the Enlightenment people, the new Gnosticism, new age spirituality. And sadly, the Jesuits, who were the ones who were going to combat that, they had been suppressed in 1773, uh, and Voltaire rejoiced that because he said there'll be nothing left in the church. Was that the Jesuits? Was that the chastisement? Maybe, because they were the ones responsible for the devotion of the Sacred Heart, and never implemented, never got the king to do it. Also, Philippe, Duke of Orleans, the cousin of the king, he felt he was far more qualified than the king and he participated in fomenting the revolution. All these things were happening. Louis XVI is why Monarch, Marie Antoinette, they came to uh, be the king and queen of France when Louis XV died. They, they, they cried when they found that he died, not because he was dead, but now they're in charge and they didn't feel ready at all. But actually, Louis XVI was actually a very good king. He worked, took his responsibility seriously, and uh, he, he, he started all kinds of reforms. So when you hear these modern uh, historians say, oh, these people are oppressed, there was no reform, the only thing they had was to rebel. Not true. Louis XVI was implementing one, uh, one kind of great reform after the other. Taxation, he knew the people were heavily taxed. The, the, the nobility and the uh, clergy were taxed, it was the poor people being taxed, and yet they couldn't get into the jobs. And so there was a lot of inequity, and he recognized that, and he started a tremendous amount of reforms. But the one problem was that he tried to do too much reform too early without following one through, and that hurt him. But what really hurt him? He wanted to be loved by his people, as we all do, but it appeared to be this fatal flaw, because the mob started taking over, and he could have stopped the revolution at any point just to put his foot down and put up a little fight. It would have stopped it all, and he didn't, and it will come back to haunt him. Political clubs were organizing demonstrations and grievances. Uh, King called for the Estates General. The Estates General were made up of three classes, the clergy, the nobility, the clergy was first, second, third. These were, the, the, the Estates General really were three classes because they had intermarried over a period of time. So it was really a distinction. But the problem was, there just wasn't a lot of representation. But he really wanted to do it, and he sent out people to get feedback to kind of start pulling this together. That's what he called the Estates General meeting. <clears throat> the problem is, what's happening? The the, all the clubs, the salons, they become political clubs. The radicals are fomenting these ideas, and they're using the press. The press in there was remarkably free. People are pretty literate. So all these ideas are being disseminated all through society, agitating the people, get more and more upset, more and more upset. So this is what's happening. So the, he calls this, and then exactly a month later, this group changes and forms what they call the National Convention. And they eventually started taking over from that point. Everything was prepared for a huge conflagration, all because of the uh, uh, fact that everything was set up by these radicals. 1789, all the actors were placed, the political clubs were organizing demonstrations and reiterating their grievances. By the way, a lot of them were lies. Uh, 
uh, grievance against the government, the desire for radical change, the Duke of Philippe of New Orleans, he's agitating more because he wants to be in power. The uh, Freemasons are agitating. The Pro Procolpe, which is a famous cafe you can still see it on the left bank there, they were meeting there, preparing their speeches. Everything was ready for the great explosion. Story of the Bastille. That's their independence day, July 14th. Significant. How did it start? King Louis XVI fires his financial reserve, who was carrying on Fannie Mae kinds of practices and was bankrupting it. So he fires him for incompetency. But the rumor goes out that somehow the people liked him, he was doing a good job, kind of like our guy here, you know, doing a good job. And, uh, that's what the media does. And so a rumor starts that the king is going to disband the National Convention that just was founded on June, June 17th, 100 years from the time when they should have implemented the conversion. So uh, these people start running back and forth, 60,000 people from the Hotel Bill, which was the headquarters of the revolution, to the Les Invalides, which was the retired, the bar barracks of retired uh, people. They break into the Les Invalides, they capture about 28,000 muskets, about 10 cannons. <coughs> then they go into the ammunition, so they run over to the Bastille, which was the jail. There were only six prisoners in the jail. People hated that because it was very formal looking. There were only six people in it. They uh, eventually, We'll get, go in there, and the Marquis is in charge of it, says, look, at, let's sit down and talk. So he brings the leaders of the revolutionary in. The crowd's outside Billy. The revolutionary leaders say, we want you to take the cannons off the wall. So they pull back the cannons, and he sits them down to breakfast to talk. Well, the people outside see the cannons, and they figure they're reloading. So they start attacking, then the revolutionaries decide rise up, and Marquis de Lanne says, hey, look at me, I'll surrender this, but come on, we've got to do this peacefully. Well, peaceful was that as soon as he let them in, they took him, they whacked his head off, uh, put it on his pipe, carried it out. Not too much longer, uh, they would rush on to the uh, Treaty of Versailles where the royal family was, and almost killed the royal family there. We'll move on to the next slide. Uh, now, the Jacobin Club's in charge. Maximilien Robespierre is the leader of it all. It's very interesting, American uh, commentary would say, Revolutions don't start with the mass, it starts with a few radicals who, who instigate and get the masses riled up. And then the masses become a mob. There's a wonderful book called The Psychology of the Mob by Le Bon, a French doctor who wrote about 100 years ago, examining actually the French Revolution and the psychology of mob. And the psychology of mob is it goes on innuendos and rumor. Uh, the, the Bastille started on a rumor. It wasn't true the king was going to do that. Someone said it, and it became Truth, and then people act on the truth, and it's incited by these kind of crazy people. Later on came the day of the daggers, where some, uh, some uh, aristocrats tried to free the royal family that was uh, taken from Versailles to the Tulier Palace, put inside there under house arrest. They tried to free them, they were sort of put into the temple prison. The depreciation campaign starts. They start taking over and start eliminating things. Then comes the uh, great day called the uh, massacres, September massacres, where a rumor game goes out, a rumor that the priests and the nobility are going to rise up, so they destroy and they go to the prison and kill all the priests and all the things who have been in prison falsely. They wipe them out. Then Louis, he's now citizen Louis Capet, he's put on trial. His, his cousin, Philippe of Orleans, gives a testimony against him, 72 hours of debate. They declared he's going to die. They headed to January 21st, 1793. About a month, two months later, who gets up with the uh, ends up on the guillotine? Philippe, who calls himself Philippe, he got it there. Uh -huh. No, I'm not, I'm not royal. I'm not one of you guys. You know? And Philippe, he got it there. He gets up on the, they're putting him on the things. You know what he said? There. Which is, you know what that one means? That's the S word in the English. That's what his response to people is a turnaround. You'll notice the revolutionaries, I call them their crocodilian. They eat their own after a while. They destroy them. The rate of terror starts. Again, starting with rumors. They start wiping out tons of people. Christianization kicks in. They start destroying beautiful art, destroying churches. Cluny, one of the most beautiful churches ever built, the third Cluny, was destroyed in the French Revolution. Notre Dame was attacked. You can still see some of the damage on the front of this magnificent architecture. They held uh, the farces. The, uh, uh, an actress was being queen of uh, the Temple of Reason. Marie Antoinette was eventually uh, beheaded. 
You know all the things, what was one of the famous lines they said that she said? Let them Let the meat cake. Yeah. Yeah. She never said that. Who said that? Rousseau said that. Rousseau said that when, when, when Marie Antoinette was only about eight or nine years old, said he heard it from some nameless princess on her lips. Let them eat cake. She never said that. She was a very kind, decent person. At the beginning of her reign, she was a little extravagant, but then she began to rise up and grow as a queen. And she, she was so kind to the people and so good. She would feed the poor and she'd have the poor come to her table. She, when they gave her gifts for Christmas, she'd let the kids look at them. She said, we're giving to the poor and they don't have anything. She was an unbelievably good king and dignified and good. Lied about. They told her, they, they get her convicted. They said, and they took her son, Louis the Seventeenth. they got him drunk, they sexually abused him, physically abused him, starved him, hurt him, and eventually when they got him drunk, they made him sign a confession that his mother and his aunt had sexual relations with incest. And they used that in the trial for her, as the left will always do, they lie about things, the radicals. They lie and lie, and they told her that she was incestuous, carried on sexual orgies. None of it was true. They convicted her, and she went dignified to her death. The only thing that stopped and eventually what happened was they started killing each other. And finally, Maximilian wrote Robespierre, the founder of it all. He got his head whacked off as well by the nation's wine and razor. That's what they called the guillotine. Here's the problem. The revolution came to see something good and liberating to be explored all over to the, explored in all the areas of the world. It still is for the left and the sisters. Hey, the idea of the revolutionary, what happened is when Napoleon went out, he stopped the, reign of, uh, the French Revolution when he took power. But we went out and these conquering things. Unfortunately, the seeds of revolution went to Poland and Russia. Uh, but they are carried by the, the soldiers that fought against the French. Virtually every country in Europe had a revolution in the course of the 19th century, mm. although the greatest of them was reserved for the 20th century. Yeah. Let's go on to the next one. Mm. Next slide. Oh. They had any idea that, no, next slide, is there next slide? Okay, that's it. Anyway, the pattern of this, brothers and sisters, it's, it continues to grow. Here's the pattern. Economic problems create civil unrest and disquiet. In comes radicals that start fermenting and fomenting uh, revolutionary ideas, take advantage of an economic downturn, use the press to promote their ideas of reform. They have moderates part of the group, but when they get to power, they wipe out the moderates, then they eliminate the only breaking voice of reason, namely the church, to wipe out the church. Then the radicals take full power and eliminate the press. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Because we're, we're going to run through this. First Vatican Council, 1870. Uh, significance of this is it defined infallibility. Not that infallibility wasn't uh, a teaching of the church. Ever since our Lord gave Peter the keys to the kingdom, the church believed that the Pope was infallible. When he spoke on matters of faith and morals, the name of the whole church, and when he says it's ex cathedra, he will speak without error. And not infallible in, in, in all things, but in the areas of faith and morals. We believe that. Now, this truth is, we believe the truth is formally defined what's being denied by heresy or people confused. One of the confusion was, remember conciliarism? We had the, the great Western system, we had three popes, and the, const, the council of constant, uh, constant solved But because of that, ideas that the council was more powerful and more authoritative than the pope, that was still hanging around. So, Pope Pius IX called the Council of, 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 of like Vatican I to be able to counteract a few things. Number one is liberalism, liberalism. This individualism, the Protestantism, these seeds, and now we're starting to infect uh, religious faith and doctrine. Theologians were influenced by it. It came out in the theory or the, uh, the heresy of modernism. You know, and modernism basically puts everything in it. If you can't explain it with your own mind, that it's not true. And the Protestant really felt that. That's where you saw Protestantism go super liberal from the time of the Reformation, real liberal. Then you had a counteracting of that with the fundamental fundamentalism that came in in the late 1800s because of the reaction to all the liberalism that came in through the Enlightenment and through rationalism. It also affected the church. And all this whole thing about what was going on uh, among all the areas of uh, of Europe, especially in Italy, Gar uh, Garibaldi and Victor Emmanuel were uniting in Italy. They, they took away the papal states from the Pope. They made him kind of a prisoner of Rome now. All this was going on at that time. So we called it to counteract the modernistic conversion of teachings, also to reassert the authority of the Pope in the light of that. So 
At the end result was that the Council of Vatican II, the significance of it, you want to go to the next slide? Uh, you keep going. Keep going. The significance of it is further defined the title of the Pope, clarified the strength of the authority of the Pope in the wake of encroaching nationalism and unification in Italy around, and around Europe. It reaffirmed the ancient teaching the church on faith and morals against the inroads of modernism and it condemned the teaching of exiliarism. That's significant in my book. Here it comes. We're going to go through this very quickly. Fabulous. What led to this? Remember now. Pattern to repeat. Communist revolution was predicted by our Indian Fabulous. People thought the children were not so crazy. A podunk little town, city, I mean, a country, backwards country of Russia. Don't tell me it's going to be the, the source of great perdition and destruction in the church. Give me a break. That's, they, they discounted it. They discounted it. But the fact of the matter is, the ideas and the pattern of revolution have been seeded already over there. What is the pattern again? When we got into this, in the, uh, from, from this, people moved in the 1900s very optimistic. All kinds of wonderful experiments and inventions going on, and seeing that science could triumph the world. Not the highest, uh, I mean, not Leo the 13th. Leo the 13th had a very pessimistic view of the world. See what was happening. In fact, he had a vision, and was, we don't know if it was a physical or a spiritual thing, but at the end result, he saw a vision that Satan was told that it was given a century, a coming century, to take over. And that's why we got that beautiful prayer of Saint Michael, the archangel. Because he also had said that after that would come Michael the Archangel of the Garden. But this was going on. He saw it as a threat of what was happening in the world. We go through all the, uh, the World War I and all the tragedies started ending and all these things are happening. In the church, we have modernism. This guy was eventually he excommunicated, but he spread his things and it got into the seminaries. And we're still, I'd say, the seminary, but we got infected by this. Modernism, which was kind of a, uh, like uh, religious theological Darwinism. Things evolve. We can't know truth. The things are archaic. We discover new truths for ourselves. This guy was very significant. He was excommunicated, but his damage was done. 19th century, look at all the things that are happening all the murders and all the assassinations, the war war, the boxer rebellion, all this is happening. Leo Smith is in successor song. And they, we were very worried. We entered World War One. Frederick Nietzsche was writing. Sigmund Freud, psychoanalysis. All this stuff is just flowing right now. Then our blessed mother appears in fabric and tells the children to tell the world to repent, to make reparation for the sins against our and her son. And if not, there would be trouble, trouble over in, in Russia. People just ignored it. You know the story. Right? Appeared uh, five times, and last was the miracle of the sun, witnessed by 70,000 people. The end result is what happens is it happened just in our plus number seven in Russia. Again, we see the pattern. There's a huge economic downturn, there's uh, severe shortages. Uh, we have a we have a emperor who patterns just like Louis XVI, a nice guy. Nicholas and Alexandria, the, the Tsar and the Tsarina, they're nice people. Uh, but, again, they're too nice. They could have put their foot down and stopped a lot of things. Two things happened. Their great, great prime minister was assassinated by the Amethyst. He was doing a tremendous amount of reform for, for Nicholas. And then the critical thing is this guy right here, Gaspian. You hear about Gaspian? Yeah. Diabolical brothers and sisters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the most dissolute, immoral people you can possibly imagine. Uh, he had superhuman strength mm -hmm. and powers. He was able to, the reason he got it tied into these two is that their son had hemophilia and he had a miraculous power to stop that. Remember, God can give you a gift, but you can use it for a lot of evil, but you still have the gift. If he had the gift of healing and stopped that thing, she became forever indebted. He's tied up in World War I fighting against the German army. They're, they're really outmanned. She is calling all the shots, influenced by him. And he has her replace all the competent government people and replace them with, with dodos, incompetent people. If a Bolshevik revolutionary was in, uh, tried to do it, wouldn't have done as good a job as that guy did, influencing her to make bad decisions. And it would ultimately result in the fact that already the revolutionaries, people like uh, Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin, they were all working 
sowing these seeds into the uh, to these the press, and then all of a sudden, because you have a weak leader who gave, kept giving in, kept giving in, giving them more and more and more economic downturn, they eventually take over the Bolsheviks. First, they had a moderate movement. By the way, the revolutionaries get moderates in, and as soon as they take power, they wipe them out. And that's exactly what happened. He got killed, by the way. Then what happened is they take over, they, and then they starve everybody out. You know, Stalin was killed. He caused a, a, a man-made uh, famine, killed five million there, he killed another seven million through collectivization. He wanted to take over their farms. They fought against them. He killed them, put them in the seed, put them in the Went on until 1953 when he died himself. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that goes over and over again. Uh, all through the world, and, and also at this time, remember, through World War, uh, we had the great flu, the world flu, the Spanish, <coughs> it was actually Spanish, but it came from America, actually. Uh, World War II, this influenza came from America, the bird flu, traveled over with our American soldiers and wiped out millions and millions of lives. And we had the Great Depression, the Great Depression staggered not just us, but everybody else. It caused the economic problems in Russia, ultimately the radicals take over, and yet, this poor thing that Mary asked for the consecration to the Immaculate Heart never happened. Even after the Pope saw all this stuff, he consecrated to the world. He never consecrated to Russia. It was kind of interesting. Even though he approved of this devotion. The point being, brothers and sisters, is this pattern keeps repeating over and over again. And it's so significant. The rain of terror comes in. By the way, this was presaged by a great red light in the sky, an unusual atmospheric thing. And no one knew it. Lucia said it was a sign that something else was going to happen terrible. And uh, what was it? It was Nazis that comes in. And Nazis that does the same thing. Germany had been bankrupt through the Versailles Treaty. They were, the, the, the marks were not worth the money to burn them. They were so bad, the economy was so bad. This guy comes in, takes advantage, and he shuts everything down. He takes power, he destroys everything. The pattern repeats over and over again. Spanish Civil War was going on as well. I think that Franco was one that stopped it. Thousands of priests and nuns in Great Catholic people were killed in the Spanish Revolution. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So here today, seeds that were sown in the Protestant Reformation created the climate of the Age of Revolution. The French Commons, Nazi, Fascist, Spanish Civil War, followed the same pattern. Mary predicted the chastisements. We can turn the chastisement back by doing reparation for sin, prayer, and consecrate ourselves for our Lord and our Lady. But sisters, those are the seeds that we need today because the seeds are starting again. It's all over. Let's go right into two more days real quick. Vatican II, just want to say this. It was the first council that was called not for heresy, but for a pastoral reason. And there was a good reason for it. The reason being is that, that things had kind of bogged down from Trent. Everything kind of stayed the same from Trent. And there needed some updating. That's what John XXIII wanted to do, was, was to update the church. Uh, Georgi Menentor, uh, I want to update it. That's what it meant. Uh, and uh, a lot of people didn't want to have it. They thought, why don't you just uh, reconvene the Vatican I Council? Because the Vatican I ended very quickly because the Italian troops were rushing into Rome, so they were just left without even closing it. Uh, it started, John, John XXIII died, Paul VI took over, and got it to conclusion. Sixteen documents came out of that. We all know that. We studied under it. Uh, there were things that were very good about this, but you know, I, I, I would say, honestly, as a priest now, 34 years, Good intent, but for people in the headiness of Reformation, they carried things off in a strange way sometimes. I, I remember as a seminary going to masses that I, I just I was scandalized by that there was all this experimentation in the name of Vatican II. You can't blame Vatican II, no. but it was all under the spirit of Vatican II. I always hate that. Like, this is the, uh, the spirit of Vatican II. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? It's not even Catholic faith. It was always under the spirit of Vatican II. I used to hate that. It's driving me nuts when I was going to the seminary. You know, they'd be teaching heresy sometimes. That's, that's heresy. But it, it came under this. Good things happened. And, uh, I think it was George Bible said it best. Just as we opened the window and let the fresh air of the Holy Spirit in, we entered in a, a very, very long tunnel with very noxious students. And the end result was we got more poison in than we got out. Uh, but we're still feeling the effects of it. So again, it's a bit. It was the first pastoral council meant to uh, uh, update the church because things had bogged down. Some reformers took excessive liberties in the name of the Spirit of Vatican II. Uh, we opened the windows when we were entering a temple with some noxious trees. The last date, 
is the election and the military leader, Mayor John Wilson. I'll just simply say, you know the story because you've lived through his life. You're blessed. And I met him twice in my life, so Max twice. And that's a beautiful thing. Uh, literally, when you say Max with the heat, he, and before prayer, I was sitting like here and there for a hope. And I was like, trying to pray, and all of a sudden I hear this. I thought it was my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> I looked around and I heard, he literally would groan in his prayer. This man would fold into like a tent of holiness. It was just the most remarkable thing. He had those beautiful blue eyes and just piercing blue eyes. I think this man deserves the title of the Great. There's only been four of the popes at that time. Leo the Great, he drove back to Attila. Well, this man, in my mind, was a man chosen by God, first non Italian since Adrian IV. His whole background set him up out of communism to come to an absolute conviction about faith in Christ, identifying the heady, heady ideas of communism that are perverted by original sin. Basically, the old pastor used to say, when you hear all these fine little theories that people had, he said, ah, but they forgot one thing, original sin. It destroys every good idea, all the man-made utopias want to create. You always got to wrench that in. But I will just simply say about this one man, uh, he did so much for the church. He's like the new Paul, the evangelist of all over the world. But here's what I think was most significant. He inspired faith back into the church, inspired a whole generation. I can't tell you the number of young men I met who were priests today because of John Paul II. He's such an inspiration. But I also personally feel that because of modernism that entered in into the church, with a lot of, uh, I, I think, even heretical teachings by certain people, it was lurching left. And I feel that it was single handed and probably the spirit of the hold of the wheel of the church, and he drove it back to center. Put his right on back onto orthodoxy. He demanded orthodoxy. But he was someone who just wasn't, he was conservative in his doctrine, but he was very, very progressive in his social gospel message to us about always caring for and eliminating those situations that set up things for, uh, for revolution. I, I, I want to just point to this. I, I'm not here to preach you, but I, I, I fear what's happening right now our political situation. And I say that because I see the patterns of this revolution, things that John Paul saw in his own life. Economic troubles build a dis disquiet and unrest. People can take advantage of it, radicals can take advantage of it, and I think it's happening. One of the ways, <coughs> the way that you eliminate any opposition is you destroy the church. And we've just seen this recently in the last month with our government telling the Catholic Church in this mandate. But it's just you don't fall prey to the trickery of the media or the government saying, oh no, we made an accommodation. There's no accommodation. It's not about contraception. This is about the violation of the First Amendment.